All right. Um, <clears throat> welcome back, everyone, to the last lecture uh, on tensor networks. Um, so in the beginning, let me just super briefly review what we did the last few lectures, just to remind you. We started by talking about the uh, structure, the nature of entanglement in many body systems. And we learned about the area law for entanglement, which basically told us that in many body systems, entanglement is distributed distributed locally. And starting from that point, what we did is was to um, come up with this ansatz of matrix product states, so MPS ansatz, which could be understood in different ways. It could be understood as um, placing entangled pairs in our system, and then applying some map, such as a projection to single out some physical degrees of freedom starting from these auxiliary entanglement degrees of freedom. It could also be understood as a way of expanding the coefficient in the computational basis as a product of matrices. Or it could also be depicted graphically by using a graphical notation for tensors as a box with three legs. So we could basically write our expansion coefficient up here as some kind of network of tensors, for instance, with periodic boundary conditions. And based on that, we saw that we can do efficient calculations with this kind of ansatz. So, So in particular, what we saw is that if we wanted to compute things like normalization, expectation values, and so further, we had to take two layers of the system and contract this network, putting some operator somewhere and maybe some other operator somewhere else when we wanted a correlation function. And then what we could do is we could cut this into slices, which we termed E. And just by multiplying these E operators, which would be something which wouldn't scale unfavorably with the system size, we could compute expectation values. And well, one thing which I would like to point out, given we have this picture here, I, I'm, well, I don't think I will get there towards the end. If yes, I will explain it in more detail. But one thing you can see is that if your system is translation invariant, all these tensors are equal, and you want to compute a correlation function between some operator X here and some operator Y here and you want to know how this scales with the separation of these operators, L. What you see is that between these two guys, there's E appearing L, or maybe L minus one, depends how you define L times. And intuitively, you would think that E kind of loses, discards a fixed amount of information about one operator when it kind of passes it on to the other one. So what you see is if you lose a fixed amount of information each time you multiply these operators, the information about x will decay exponentially in that direction. So what it means is that correlation functions in these systems decay exponentially. One can phrase it more clearly by doing an eigenvalue decomposition of E. I don't want to do that because it's a little bit lengthy. It's not very complicated, but a bit lengthy. Um, but a main message one can kind of already infer from that is if I lose a fixed amount of information in each of these E's, then what, what this implies is that correlations decay exponentially. <clears throat> so indeed, if, if, if you know about many body physics, you, you, you might know that, well, there are, there are systems which are critical, which usually have algebraic correlations, they're scale invariant, and these are the systems where the energy gap closes. So the fact that the correlations decay exponentially is certainly consistent with the fact that these states describe ground states of gap Hamiltonians well, because for gap Hamiltonians, there's actually a theorem saying that all correlations decay exponentially. And conversely, for critical systems, we would not expect an uh, exponential decay. Okay, so what I explained in the last lecture was that matrix product states are a very useful ansatz for numerical simulations, and indeed they're extremely powerful. What I would like to look at today or to, to discuss today is a different application of matrix product states, 
namely using them as a way of coming up with solvable models, with models where we can kind of construct a Hamiltonian and a wave function, which is its ground state, which has exact matrix product form. And starting from there, we can try to understand the physics of these systems and maybe classify the behavior, the way in which this quantum system behaves from this ansatz. That would be a section of study of quantum phases. with matrix product states. And to start with, let me get back to um, something I already discussed like yesterday morning, I think it was, right? Namely the AKLT model, but now in a bit more detail. Named after Affleck. Kennedy, Leap, and Tazaki. Um, okay, so, so basically I will start by restating what I explained the other day. So what we have is we take maximally, we take entangled states, and now our entangled states are slightly different. They're singlets, and, and these systems here are now supposed to be spin one half systems. So they're two level systems, but really with a notion of being a spin one half system with having a well spin up or a spin down state. And this state omega hat should be a singlet state. Now you might wonder if that's a fundamental difference to this construction here. And the answer is it's not, because if I have a singlet state, I can always understand the singlet state as a normal state, which is 0, 0, plus 1, 1, and then acting with some operation, right? If I have 0, 0, plus 1, 1, and then I act with something like sigma y or i sigma y tensor identity on it, then I will get exactly a singlet state, right? <laughs> because it flips the spin and it adds a minus. So I get one zero minus zero one. So it means that up to the action of a sigma y, this is completely equivalent to the original construction I proposed. But then if I have to act with a sigma y on this side here, I can equally well absorb the sigma y in the p, right? So all I have to do is to say, okay, I could as well start, so if I have this guy plus some map p, I could as well take this guy and add some map P times identity tensor I sigma Y. Because this will exactly put this I sigma Y here and convert it into a singlet. So it's really the same thing, right? I can just move this sigma Y from one part of the construction to the other. So we have this um, singlet here. And well, it's a singlet. What does it mean? It means that whenever I act with any U in SU2, I have that U tensor U applied to omega hat is omega hat. So it's um, SU2 invariant, which is not surprising because that's what the singlet is defined to be. So that's part one of the construction. Part two is to say what is this map which we apply. So what is a map which we apply? Well, we have these two spin one halves. Now we want to apply a map, and the point is if we have two spin one halves, we know that we can decompose them as a spin one component and a spin zero component. So this is a singlet state, and these are the three triplet states, triplet bell states, for instance, which span the spaces. So now what we can do is we can choose a map which only keeps a spin one component. So P would be the projection onto the spin being one, which is nothing but saying the SZ equal plus one state corresponds to up up. The SZ equal zero state in the new basis corresponds to a singlet, uh, sorry, to a triplet. 
and a minus one to both spins pointing down, which is exactly the basis of the spin one state, right? It's all but the singlet state. So now if we do this construction, what we can see, so if we have a, a rotation in SU2, we can of course find some representation of this rotation on spin one, right? It's just a, a spin rotation. And what we see in that case, I mean, you can explicitly go through it, but basically it's a way of defining what it means to act with a rotation on a spin one if you know what it means to act on a spin one half. Namely, so if I have some RU, which is a spin one representation, of that rotation u, I will see that rotating the spin one system is nothing but doing the same rotation on the spin one half system. So what I'm saying is whether I rotate here or whether I rotate here doesn't make any difference. It's exactly the same, just in one case I have to act with a spin one rotation while here I have to act with a spin one half rotation on both sides. So this implies that the overall wave function is invariant under rotation, right? So this implies that the overall wave function, so if I rotate all the spins, and psi is the wave function constructed from this P, well, then what we have is that we have RU tensor N, and well, psi is P tensor N acting on omega hat tensor N. Now what we know is that each of these RUs, well, satisfies this equation here. So what we have is we have RU times P tensor N acting on omega hat tensor N. And this again, using that condition, is nothing but P times U tensor U times N. So overall we have P times N, U tensor 2N acting on omega hat tensor N. But now using the other condition, namely that the state is a singlet, we find that the state is invariant, right? So what we find is that the omega hat is left invariant. So this is just P times N acting on omega hat times N. And this is just exactly our original state Psi. Ah, no, well, the it doesn't really commute, right? I mean, the, the equation is that, right? If it's on the left, it's a spin one rotation. And if I try to move the spin one rotation through the P, so the P maps two spin one halves onto one spin one. So if I do a rotation on the two spin one halves in the same way, that's equivalent of doing the same rotation on the spin one. But I mean, same rotation means, you know, representation of the element of the rotation group. P times U plus U Say again. One to the left yes. P times U plus U yes. But then you're back right. Oh, but it's a tensor product, right? I mean, what's, what's written here is, um, right? What's written here is, or here is something like P times U tensor U, tensor product with P times U tensor U, and so further. Ah, yeah, I mean, that's supposed to be a tensor product here, right? Otherwise, indeed, this wouldn't make much sense. All right. Okay, so what do we learn from that? We learn from that. That this wave function psi is invariant under spin rotations, right? 
So if you construct our wave function exactly that way with these entangled states and the circles, we will obtain a rotationally invariant wave function. That's, of course, nice because in physics we like systems with high degrees of symmetry, but of course we would like maybe to have a bit more. Um, we, we, we might want to be interested in seeing if this wave function maybe also appears in a natural way as a ground state of some interaction, which also has the same symmetry. So we would like to construct a Hamiltonian for this wave function. Okay, so if we want to construct the Hamiltonian, so how will we proceed? So let's start by looking at just a few sites. I mean, the Hamiltonian acts locally, right? Um, so we, we should start by understanding what local properties a system has, which we might be able to single out using some Hamiltonian. So we start by considering two sites. So what do we have? We have a spin one half particle here. We have this entangled state of two spin one half particles, which is overall a singlet, right? So the total state has actually spin zero, consists of two spin one half, but it's a singlet, it's spin zero. And we have another spin one half. And now we apply this map, right? So we take this guy here and we take this guy here, and we apply the projection onto their joint spin one space, so we obtain a spin one particle. And we obtain another spin one particle. So now what can we say about this system? Okay, so, so let's look at, at, the, at these two sides, right? Let's, I mean, this chain goes on here, but we, we don't want to think about it, right? Something is happening there, which means that these states will have some value, which they get from, well, the rest. But let's not think too much about it. Let's say we just don't have any prior information on it. So what can we say? Well, if we look at these two states, right, that's two spin one particles. So they live in a total space built by two spin one particles. So it's a spin one times a spin one. So overall, two spin ones decompose as either a spin zero component or a spin one component or a spin two component. That's something which is well, well known from spin theory. So these are the possible values this can take. Okay, so now let's look up here. So what can we say up here? Well, up here we have four spin one halves on the one hand, which actually decomposes in a very similar way. But if we look more closely, we know more, right? What we know is that here, the thing in the middle is actually a spin zero state. So what we do have in fact up here is the left thing has a spin one half. Then the two middle ones jointly have spin zero, and the right one again has spin one half. So what this is in total is just the same as spin one half times spin one half, which is spin zero plus spin one. So we start from something which has spin zero or spin one. We apply this projection. It's a projection, it doesn't change the spin. It removes certain spin sectors, but it doesn't change it, right? So it must be the same afterwards. We start it in zero or one. We end up in this space which can support zero or one or two. But well, we start it in zero or one, so we cannot get this two, right? So this is forbidden. So what we see is that overall in the system, the spin two state on two adjacent sides cannot appear. So now we can use this as a way of constructing a Hamiltonian. We can, we can, we can do the following. We can define a two-body Hamiltonian on two adjacent sides i and i plus one which is a projector onto the joint spin two state, right? This joint space has spin zero, spin one, or spin two. 
It's a projector into the spin two state. So what does it mean? It gives energy one to the spin two state and energy zero to the other states. So if we now take this guy and we apply it to our wave function, psi, this AKLT wave function, what does it mean? Well, we have seen that for the AKLT wave function, we cannot have spin two. So, well, we're in the kernel of the projector, so we get zero, right? At the same time, of course, we know that this thing, because it's a projector, is positive semi-definite, right? Because, well, it has eigenvalue zero or one. So now we can make a full Hamiltonian out of that by putting this term everywhere on some chain with periodic boundaries. And well, what we will find is, of course, exactly the same, right? Acting with a full Hamiltonian on psi, we still get zero because each term individually gives zero. And of course, if we sum up a set of positive semi-definite operators, we again get a positive semi-definite operator. So the total Hamiltonian has only, well, zero or positive eigenvalues. So what does it tell us? Well, it tells us It tells us that psi is a ground state of that Hamiltonian, right? Because we know that this Hamiltonian has eigenvalues zero and larger, and this is a, an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero, which is the smallest eigenvalue, so psi is a ground state. Okay, so now, what it actually turns out is that, I will not discuss this here, but one can prove the following thing, namely, first of all, one can show that this psi in this case is the only ground state. of that Hamiltonian, so it's a unique ground state. And second of all, there's a gap above this ground state. So what we have this way is that we really obtain a Hamiltonian where we well, we have a Hamiltonian, but we also understand the ground state wave function, and it has an exact matrix product form. So we really basically found some way of constructing a solvable model. So we, we obtain a, some kind of solvable model namely a gapped Hamiltonian plus a ground state wave function. Okay, so one thing I should maybe add just very briefly is that um, I constructed a very specific example, so you might think it's indeed specific to this example that I can construct a Hamiltonian given a matrix product state, but this is not the case. What I really did in some sense is the following. One thing I asked is how big is this space here? This space here is, well, capital D, sorry, small d, physical dimension to the two-dimensional. In this case, the physical dimension is three for a spin one system, so this is three, three to the two-dimensional. Then I asked how many states can I find in this space, in this construction? Well, I said this state is completely fixed, so one degree of freedom I have is here, choosing two possible values, and one degree of freedom I have here is choosing two possible values, right? And then basically what I said is, well, how many values can I obtain? Well, I can obtain d square equal two square equal four states in what? Well, in a d square equal three square equal nine dimensional space. <clears throat> 
And from that I said, well, I can only get four states in the nine-dimensional space, five are missing. I can define a Hamiltonian which gives a higher energy to those which are missing, right? So I can define a Hamiltonian which is a projector onto the missing ones. Now, now it already sounds much more general. All I need is that kind of this space is bigger than that space. Now you might say, okay, but this depends on the choice of these parameters. This must be smaller than that one. But even that need not be the case because there's no, no specific reason to consider two sides. I could do the same for three sides or for some number L of sides, right? So if I do this for L sides, I get D to the power L here. So in the general case, what I would have, I would have capital D squared states, and it's always square because that's the size of the boundary. The boundary has a fixed size independent of the length of the block. So I would have capital D squared in a small d to the L dimensional space. And you can easily see that at some point, of course, this space will be bigger than that one if I increase L. And since this goes exponentially, it will happen rather quickly. And in that number of sites, you will always be able to construct such a Hamiltonian. And it actually turns out that this will always, under generic conditions, have a unique ground state and be gapped. So in fact, this is a general construction. Well, it depends what you start from, right? If all initial ingredients are rotationally invariant, say, you said rotationally invariant, right? Yes. If all initial ingredients are rotationally invariant, what you get finally will also be rotationally invariant. Because you see what you're looking at is the, the orthogonal complement of all the states you can generate with general boundary conditions. So you could as well choose rotationally invariant boundary conditions. Well, not as vectors, right? They might transform like non-trivial irreps, but the projector will be rotationally invariant. So in the end, the projector onto all states you get will be rotationally invariant if, if the objects you use, so this state here and these states here have any kind of symmetry, in fact. Um, then the same symmetry will also be seen in the space of states here, not in individual states, but in the space. And this is just one minus a projector onto the, those states, so it's all, it also has that symmetry. So indeed, you can generally construct any kind of symmetric Hamiltonians by starting from a correspondingly symmetric wave function and it's indeed an important point that you can encode all these symmetries locally, right? It's really like what happened here. You want that, that P has a nice behavior relative to the symmetry. And I guess I erased it, the singlet, so the, the bond you use also has a nice behavior. Then the overall thing will have a nice behavior. And the remarkable thing is that there's a theorem which says it's the only way of getting symmetries. If you want to get a symmetry, you can always get it by encoding it locally. Of course, you, I mean, obviously you can cheat around and make it look like it's not local, but in fact, there's always a way of getting it locally. So you don't get any extra cases by considering weird ways maybe of rotating the symmetry. It's always encoded in the P and in the omega individually. Okay, so before discussing some of the features you get from that, let me briefly say where this comes from and why people were very interested in this construction. Um, so, so one thing, if you just work out the Hamiltonian, for the AKLT case, it's actually a nice exercise to try to think how can I re-express this projector in terms of spin operators. I mean, you can do it brute force, but there's some kind of more elegant argument um, based on, well, spin addition and things like that. But in the end, what you get is that this projector to the spin two subspace is of the following form. It has a term which is a Heisenberg interaction. It has a, well, you might argue, comparatively small correction to the Heisenberg term. And well, a constant which doesn't really matter. So this is kind of close to Heisenberg, right? And this was really the original motivation of uh, Affleck, Kennedy, Lieber, and Tazaki to construct this wave function. 
namely uh, what is known as a Haldane conjecture. So this would really give a rigorous proof or an example of a variant of the Haldane conjecture. which is among the things, I think, for which Haldane actually got awarded the Nobel Prize. And the thing is the following. So what Haldane considered was, let's look at a pure Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And well, now there are two cases. So the spin could be half integer, or the spin could be integer. So spin one half, spin one, spin three half, and so on. And for half integer spin, there had been a result by Lieb, Schulz, and Mattis. Where they show that these systems must be gapless in some sense. Either they must be critical. So a whole bunch of low-lying excitations, or they must be symmetry-breaking, so having at least a second degenerate state. And what Haldane showed by mapping this to something which is known as a nonlinear sigma model, he showed that in the integer case, it's very different, that integer and half-integer behave very different. And based on that, he stated that in the integer case, the Hamiltonian has a unique ground state with a gap above. It was really mostly based on the rotational symmetry. So Affleck, Lieb, Kennedy, and Tazaki um, took this model, which had the same kind of symmetry properties. And for that one, they could really rigorously prove that this system has a unique ground state and a gap above. <coughs> That's all day. Okay, so in the last, uh, what, 10 or 15 minutes, I would like to briefly talk about some consequences, or some kind of special features one can see on this kind of AKLT construction relating to kind of non-trivial um, phases, non-trivial behavior of systems under symmetries in one dimension. So this would be about edge modes and fractionalization. So for one thing, let's, so let's again take this AKLT chain. And let's ask if we look at a specific position and we cut the system in two halves at that position, what can we say about the way in which the left and the right half is entangled? So the entanglement here comes from a spin one half, right? It comes from this singlet, which sits between these two spin one-half degrees of freedom. So what this kind of suggests is indeed that the way, if I would act with a symmetry on my system with some rotation, it's a spin one chain. And I would ask, what happens to the entanglement? I'm being a bit vague. I will try to make it more concrete in a moment. If, if, I, act with the entang if I act with a rotation on my system, I, I could ask, what happens to the entanglement? Does it also transform in some way? And well, what we certainly see is if we act with some rotation here everywhere, this will amount to some different rotation acting on the entangled states, right? But this other, so here I would act with a spin equal one, whereas the rotation would act like a spin one half on the entanglement, 
And that's kind of curious in the sense that what we actually have is we have a physical spin one half, but the entanglement of, in the system behaves like a spin one half, right? So what we have is that we have a spin one chain, but the entanglement transforms as a spin one half. So this, this spin one particles in our, which, which build up our system break up in some sense into spin one half particles, which are fractional particles in some sense, right? Spin one is the elementary building block of that thing. I can't really create spin one half objects in a spin one chain, right? I could you know, flip a spin, I can create a spin one excitation, I can't create spin one halves. So there's some kind of fractionalization of the physical spin in the entanglement. If you want to see this a bit more concretely, you can use this entangled bond and make a Schmidt decomposition of your chain and then ask how do the Schmidt vectors transform and you will see they do exactly transform like a spin one half. So another thing related to, well, not entanglement, but the edge, is what I would like to explain next. That's another instance where we see fractionalization. So what we could consider is we could start from our original Hamiltonian we constructed on a periodic boundary system, but then remove the term which crosses a boundary. So open up the boundaries. So for periodic boundaries, we have a unique ground state. So now we could take our Hamiltonian and put in a system with open boundary conditions and ask what happens. And well, what we have in this chain, if we put it in a system with open boundary conditions, is that we have Hamiltonian terms acting everywhere. So we have a Hamiltonian term acting here and a Hamiltonian term acting here and a Hamiltonian term acting, whoops, small h acting here, but we don't have Hamiltonian terms acting on the edge. Now what kind of each Hamiltonian term makes sure is that our state looks like it's constructed from putting an entangled bond here and applying the correct map here and here, but it does, the Hamiltonian doesn't care about these two sides at the edge, right? It was exactly constructed in such a way that whatever I put here and here, this two-body Hamiltonian would have a, as, as a ground state any state I can get by putting anything here and here I want, but leaving the rest the way it should be. So what it means is that there is no Hamiltonian term here which would impose any boundary condition at the, on the term at the corner, right? So this term could be anything. So here, well, that's not, here I could put any state phi left and I would always have something which is a ground state of this Hamiltonian, right? Because that's how it's constructed. Same here, I could put any state phi right And I would always have a ground state of all the Hamiltonian terms again, because even the, the last term is constructed in such a way that whatever I put here, I will have a ground state. So what I obtain this way is I obtain a set of states, all of which are ground states of my, my chain. So, So all states with any <laughs> psi left and psi right are ground states. And using the same techniques, one can indeed show that these are the only ground states we get. So what does it mean? Well, it means that kind of, well, if I remove a term, 
coupling a ring, I get new excitations, right? Because one constraint, one Hamiltonian term is missing. I get new states, which can also be ground states. Now, the ground states, the new ground states depend on parameters which sit in the left and on the right edge. But each of these guys, again, corresponds to a spin one half, right? So again, phi left and phi right transform like spin one halves. And the other thing is that indeed when I change phi left, I will only see this effect close to the boundary if I do any measurement on my system. Again, because all, the, all effects decay exponentially. So what we have is what people would call edge modes. So excitations which, which live close to the edge. And the edge modes are again spin one half edge modes in this case. So again, what we have is that the, the physical spin one system, if we introduce an edge to the system, fractionalizes into a spin one half on the left end and a spin one half on the right end. And that's something which is kind of very peculiar. It's, it's, it's really something which, um, which doesn't show up in conventional matter. If you would make kind of a product and that's not have entanglement, you couldn't have excitations whose charge in the sense of how do they transform under a symmetry, under say spin rotation, is a fraction of the transformation property of the original system, right? If you have an integer spin system, you can only change the spin by integers. The new thing will again transform like an integer. It will never transform like a spin one half. So that's something which is really only possible because of this non-trivial entanglement structure in our system. And that's something which indeed gives rise to a classification of, of phases, of inequivalent phases in the presence of a symmetry, which is something, again, which is not present if you do mean field theory, if you do Landau theory. So let me just say a few words about that. And it's really related to the following fact. Uh, there is something which we term the fundamental theorem of MPS. And well, what it states is it tells us if we have two inequivalent ways of describing the same matrix product states, what is the relation between them. But an important consequence of that theorem is the following. If I have a matrix product state psi with a symmetry, so there's some UG, some representation of a group, which leaves this invariant by acting everywhere. Then what we have is the following. We have that in a graphical language, if we take our A, and now we're talking about translation invariant systems all the time, right? We want translation invariant Hamiltonians and so on. So there's only one tensor A, then it tells me that if I multiply this with the action of the physical transformation, this just amounts to multiplying A with a different action, VG and VG dagger, which is a unitary, on the auxiliary degrees of freedom. So you can actually convince yourself immediately that if you have a chain of these A's with periodic boundaries, if you act with U everywhere, you will get a symmetric wave function because the V and the VG on adjacent A's will all cancel out, nothing will change. But the really important thing is that, so you might say, well, the VG transforms exactly the same way as a UG. So it's a representation of the same group, right? So what we have is that we have that UG UH is UGH because it forms a representation of a group like the rotation group. But now what does this mean? I mean this A establishes an isomorphism between this here and these two guys here. So it really tells us that VG tensor VG dagger times VH tensor VH dagger, I think I'm cheating a bit, is something like VGH tensor VGH dagger. <coughs> 
So this means that indeed the first tensor component must again obey the same kind of condition. But the point is a phase is not well defined because it's a dagger. It could compensate for any phase which I have on the other side. So really I only get this equivalence up to a phase. And this is what is known as a projective representation. So a particular example would indeed be the case where UG is a spin rotation of an integer spin. So specifically, this should be the rotation group in real space SO3. And then I can build integer spin representations, which are normal representations, or I can build half integer spin representations. So if the VG would be a half integer spin, then this would have a non-trivial phase. I mean, if I cheat a bit, it's due to the fact that if you rotate by two pi, you get minus one. That's not really the point because this can be compensated by a gauge. But if you combine several rotations, then it turns out that the spin one half has a phase which you cannot remove regardless of how you choose your phase conventions. So it turns out that there are inequivalent classes of these projective representations. And well, one, one example of inequivalent classes are integer and half integer spin rotations. And it turns out because they're inequivalent, there's no way of combining them, right? Inequivalent, state this here. Well, it's a, a normal representation wouldn't have a face here, right? I think it's called projective because in principle, if you were a mathematician, you wouldn't write it like that, but you would write in a projective space, so in a space modulo C. Exactly, let me just state the, but yeah, indeed. Um, okay, so what we have is that we can have inequivalent projective representations. And it turns out they cannot be combined. And this implies that there's no way to kind of smoothly deform a state where this transforms in one way to one where it transforms in the equivalent ways. So different MPS cannot be connected with inequivalent So they cannot be connected smoothly meaning within the set of matrix product states, meaning within the set of gapped phases. So it means that these indeed classify inequivalent phases. Under symmetries. And this is what is known as symmetry protected phases. or short SPT, where the T stands for symmetry protected topological, or some people claim trivial, because they're not topological, so I just prefer to just call them symmetry protected phases. And that's really a, a quantum phenomenon. These states, while they don't have long range entanglement, we're in one dimension, have an entanglement which transforms in a non-trivial way under the symmetry. So as long as we keep the symmetry, they cannot be transformed into systems into other systems where the entanglement transforms differently, say like an integer spin. And that's why the Haldane phase and the AKLT model are in one of these symmetry protected phases. All right, thanks for your attention. Thank you.